Yusuf Hamad comes to us from Beko Capital. His, uh, his colleague Surush wasn't able to join us today. Um, unfortunately. Unfortunately, yes. Um, you'll see his profile um, in the actual guidebook. And um, both of them have actually uh, were the first pioneers in our first Google Hangout on our uh, YouTube channel. So for whoever actually watched that, um, we have them live here today. We have Yusuf live here today. So um, Yusuf, um, I think a lot of, I don't know if everybody knows, can we see a, a, a show of hands? Does everybody know who Beto Capital is over here? Okay. Five, six, Only that's it? From Google. Over Hangouts. here. Okay, we have two over here. Okay, so I think Yusuf, you need to tell them your story. Can I, can I though ask a question first by show of hands? How many entrepreneurs or future entrepreneurs are in the crowd? Okay. Okay, you guys need to know Yusuf. And how many investors or future investors in startups are in the crowd? None. Okay, and, and, and the rest, I guess, are networking. Okay. Got it. So I guess the story, uh, Beko Capital was started in 2012. We're a team of uh, six investment professionals. Our CEO, Danny Farha, was the founder of Babe.com. Uh, a lot of you guys know would know the, the job recruiting website. He started the company in 2001, and then he sold uh, in 2011 to Tiger Global. The rest of us, all six, uh, all six uh, investment professionals, we're all ex-entrepreneurs. So we, have, we all have that in common. We've been on the other side of the table, uh, and we all have corporate experience, like uh, Mohammed was saying, corporate experience is important. Um, uh, since 2012 until today, we have, we've made about 10 investments, uh, only in the technology space in the Middle East. Um, our largest two are Property Finder, uh, the real estate classified website, and Kareem. Um, and then we have five unannounced uh, investments so far, at least what we call stealth startup. So once they're big and ready, then we announce. Um, and we've uh, and, and the way the way we operate is we're just like a startup. So we went and raised money from family and friends and high net worth individuals, and we took that money into our company, and then we went out and invested that uh, that money. And we've deployed close to thirty five million dollars so far. And now we're going out and fundraising again, so we can we continue this uh, this journey. Okay, Yusuf. So now I think all of you guys are going to get more interested uh, to hear about Yusuf, knowing that he can actually give you money. Um, we talk Go about to first. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, we talk about technology, and I know that that go invest into technology startups. What does that mean? And is there any sector in particular, or subsector in technology that you focus on? And Mohammed said, you know, you need to have a little bit of experience before coming in. Do you guys invest in somebody with just an idea? So let me let me answer the second question first. An idea we do not invest in. I think you know, ideas are ideas. We need to see a little bit of traction. We need to see a little bit of product. We need to see a little bit of execution uh, before we invest. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't get money outside. I think every every company has or every there is an investor type or category for every stage of the company's life first go to your family and friends go to your father mother brother cousins uh, colleagues and raise money and then go to angel investors who will see the potential but without invest without a product but then, and then you'll have the venture capitalists who will come in later and, and see some execution within it. But it's a small, they invest when the company is still small and there's still a small team. And then private equities will come, will come later. Um, now in terms of uh, what technology, what does what the technology sector mean for, means for us? I mean technology by definition it's, you know, the application of science and engineering uh, to solving a problem or creating a product. So as long as there's some element of that, or a big element of that actually, then, then we're interested. Obviously, there are sectors that we like within uh, within the technology sector. Uh, we're in the Middle East, we're still digitizing. We're coming from the offline to the online world. Uh, we're far behind, so so any company that does that, I think these are you know the, the, uh, the easy to reach, these are the, the low-hanging fruits, so we really love them. Um, in terms of specific sectors, we like big problems that are solved. So infrastructure problem, if you look at our portfolio, I mentioned Kareem and, and uh, Property Finder, real estate, Logistics and transportation, these are really big problems that are solved by technology. Uh, we like marketplaces where we're the middleman and, and, and there is supply and demand. Uh, we like enterprise because the region has, I mean, Saudi Al-Hala has about 20,000 SMEs registered per month. 
uh, all these companies need enterprise solutions and they need to be localized. 90% of Saudi might speak Arabic, 85% in Egypt might speak Arabic, so you need you need that localized solution. So we like we like enterprise services as well. So these are some of the main uh, main sectors that we like. So Yusuf, um, I know that you know you say about like you know Kareem has been you know like a regional success and all of that. What are your views? I mean, why did you guys decide to set up in the region? Why not somewhere else? You guys are all entrepreneurs. Why did you decide to, to be here? I mean, the region is is, is quite. Uh, there are multiple multiple uh, reasons. But if you kind of take a step back and you look at what would make a successful entrepreneurial ecosystem, it's two things. It's willingness and the know-how. And the willingness where fifth, more than 50% of the region are below the age of 35 years old. These are young, courageous, they're risk takers, and that's the willingness. The know-how, I think somebody here asked a question about the know-how. You know, what technology has created today is a level playing field. The world is flat. Um, Google did a survey a few months ago in Saudi, and 80% of people surveyed in Saudi have responded that they believe they're able to learn anything they want on YouTube, only YouTube, regardless of the outside of it. So I think that created the know-how. So the combination of the two, you know, makes a wonderful formula for a successful ecosystem. Here. Okay, so now we want you guys to participate once again in the poll. So. What is the biggest challenge when approaching a regional VC? So we have Yusuf up here, so we can pull and ask him right live. You know, you know, what is your biggest challenge and what he thinks is your big like? How can he can answer your question on that? Um, but in the meantime, while I get you all to pull, you know, we speak about you know fintech, medtech, and digitech, and you just spoke about digital technology and how we're still coming on the from the offline to the online. Uh, do you think that we have a chance in the region when it comes to fintech? We've, we've been talking about it a lot. And we have Islamic finance, and a lot of people are talking about focusing on that from even a government perspective. What are your views from Beko? I mean, I think uh, Philip made a really good comment. I think Bahrain, you know, was the financial leader in the region. Um, if you look at, you know, the replica of Bahrain in Europe, it's the UK, right? Um, the UK is the financial leader in Europe and in the world, and, and they are the leaders in fintech. Um, fintech is, uh, you know, the, app, the application digitizing the, the banking sector and, and disrupting the banking sector. And I think if you know, if you ask anybody in this room or outside this room how happy they are with their banks, everybody, everybody will shout and scream and, and, and try to find ways to disrupt them. We still have to go and stand in lines to cash a check. And now we can put it inside an ATM machine and it takes two weeks to get that. So yes, we have we have the ability in the region to disrupt. But obviously there are, there are limitations uh, or there are more advanced technologies that might come from elsewhere and the application is going to take time. But if you look at the region here, and I'm going to compare it a little bit to Southeast Asia, I think you need to do micro innovations to really localize the solution. And I think these small micro innovations that are built on one big uh, innovation or innovative platform that's built, that, built, that was built elsewhere, I think that's where the region has a chance. So when you say micro innovation, for those of us who might not know what that means, what does that mean? What's the difference? Uh, it's customizing uh, a, a solution for the region. So if I'm if I'm thinking if I'm thinking of Kareem, for example, Kareem when they first started, they had cash payments. You know, Saudi and Bahrain with Kuwait, uh, the credit card penetration is below 50%. So that's a local that's a locally customized solution. Um, uh, for example, Saudi, a lot of the drivers of Saudi, Saudi and uh, a lot of the passengers, 85% of the passengers are females. So when a driver picks up a female passenger, the phone number doesn't show up. That's a very local solution. I think a lot of the females of Saudi would get upset if the driver calls them after hours or, or, or whatnot. So I think that's a very local, customized solution. That's a lock-in. They really locked in the passenger because of these small micro -innovation. Yeah, that's very interesting to hear. And then, you know, you were saying about disruption. What does that mean? You know, we think about, okay, we had some people talking and disrupting us here on the stand. But what does it really mean when it comes to the whole, uh, you know, innovation space and you investing into startups that disrupt? I mean, disrupting is looking at an old business model and really, I don't want to say killing it, but really doing something that's 10x better than that. I think if you're, if you're looking at the banking sector, for example, and 
Today you have to go to the bank and stand, take a number and stand in line and then, and then go uh, and, and transact. If, if a startup comes or a business model comes up where you can on, get on your phone and get the number before you reach, that's not disruption. This is skip the line businesses. This is one step better than the alternative. But the challenger banks, what they call them, the online banks where I can actually, I don't need to go to a physical bank. I have my phone and that is all I need. I can transact online, I can pay, I can withdraw, I can transfer, um, and I never have to go to the bank. Now that's, that's, what, that's disruption. Okay, so now we have uh, the results locked in from the poll. So what do you think of this, Yusuf? So 43% of the people here today or who have actually polled have said understanding valuation of the company. So how, what does, how does Veco value a company and why do you think that that's a, a challenge for these uh, um, startups to come? We still struggle with valuing companies. It's, it's still very difficult. Like, I mean, valuation is more of an art rather than a science. And I think uh, a lot of elements come into play, especially at the very early stage. Um, and, and I think we look at it, we reverse engineer it. We look at how strong is this team, how awesome is this company, do we really want to really invest, how big is the market opportunity. And then you got to link, we, we think in the long run. We say, all right, well, we want to invest and we want to take a meaningful percentage or stake in the company so that we're incentivized to spend time and support them. But at the same time, they're going to go through multiple rounds of funding, and then they get diluted. Their share is going to get go less and less and less. So we want to make sure that from the beginning, they're not they don't lose 50, 60, 40 percent of their business. So that is one big element that we look at. Um, uh, but at the same time, the technical methodology of valuing a company is we look at comparables. There is a company that is. Uh, if somebody comes to us today and say, I have, says, I have a social platform um, or a chat platform and we have one million users, WhatsApp has whatever X amount of uh, uh, a billion plus users and zero revenue. And these guys would have zero revenue. So what we would do is we'd see you know, the valuation of WhatsApp was about $19 billion. Their value per user, if you divide it, was about 50 cents, to the dollar, 50 cents per, per monthly active user. And say, all right, well, you have about a million users monthly active users, you know, and if WhatsApp was at 50 cents, the market here is much smaller, you're in a much earlier stage, the risks are higher, so we probably value you somewhere at 25 cents per active user, so your value is about $250,000. Okay. Don't take, don't take my word for that, it's just <laughs> an assumption. Okay, um, Yusuf, we're going to open the floor for questions. Um, anyone out here, okay, we have somebody, please introduce yourself so we can hear your name and uh, call you out. Assalamu uh, alaikum. My name is Ahmed bin Abdulhab from Saudi Arabia and I'm a, uh, I am a financial accountant. Uh, my question is, uh, do you have um, a technique uh, when, you find an, uh, when you find an idea, uh, do you have a technique uh, how to evaluate it? And what if the idea that comes to you uh, and needs to be invested, uh, you don't have the right expertise to value it uh, in the right way? For example, if someone comes to you with a nanotechnology or something that you really don't understand, and of course all of us are still in a learning curve and uh, we don't understand anything. So what's your decision on that? Uh, plus the other question is, uh, I want to ask you to be honest, is uh, as a professor from Saudi, and uh, I've been in like for the five, last five years, been all to uh, the uh, bridge of, uh, let's say, the, uh, the organizations who support entrepreneurs around the kingdom. What do you think about the people who manage them, uh, what kind of knowledge they have, according to the uh, young people we have in Saudi Arabia, that they got the talents that they need to support them. The first uh, organization I did out Saudi Arabia that uh, supports talent and technical uh, ideas outside Saudi Arabia was Rawad, uh, Rawad uh, uh, program, and it took for me so, uh, so innovative and so different. Okay, well, I, need to, different I need to clap for that. Are you paying him? Sorry? How much are you paying I actually am not. It's the first time I meet him, actually, so thank you. <laughs> no, honestly, I, I wish like, we have it like um, we start in Saudi Arabia to have our own models around GCC countries instead of just going around all around the world and see the Westerns. We got something like really interesting over here and really professional and really high. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I'll. Uh, uh, okay, all right. So the first. Uh, I'll answer the first question is, if we don't know something or don't understand it, how do we evaluate it? Which is a very fair statement, and I think 
there is, everybody has a zone of genius. Everybody's good at something. You're a financial accountant, your partner will be the sales uh, uh, person, and you have another partner who's the tech. So everybody has, uh, our job as investors is to make sure that we understand the business we invest in. Even if we don't know internally, we build the network. We have strong relationships in the US. We have strong relationships in Silicon Valley, in New York, in London. And we have strong relationships around the region. We build relationships with universities and research institutions. And we fly out and we meet them and we spend time. So we tap into that network. Um, a part of our review process is we reach out to five experts. Not one, not two, five experts to, to evaluate, give us an evaluation on the business and the technology. And that is just before we say yes, and then we go through a diligence process. So that's how we really uh, approach it. But I'll, I'll have to say, if, if it's a business that we don't know how to add value in, we probably will not invest in it. The, the main reason here is we're, we're not only financial investors. Very similar to Hamid's business model, where we give functional support. We have a team that comes in and supports every startup that we invest in. And, we, and uh, that's a very selfish reason. Our, our value investment is probably going to increase when we do that. So if we don't know how to add value, we probably shy away from it. Um, the second part about the ecosystem and the availability of organizations. I think, look, take a look back at the past few years. I think uh, if you look at the last three, four years, there. When Beko Capital started, there was nothing in the ecosystem. Uh, we were doing deal by deal, and it wasn't really, um, uh, it wasn't really a venture capital firm at that time. Today, there are probably 10, 12, 15 venture capital firms that invest. You just had heard an announcement today uh, of a new venture capital firm. Um, so I think the ecosystem is growing, and you've got the accelerators who are growing. I mean, there's Studia, there is a few. Uh, Aramco has one, and there's STC that manages Inspire U, and there's Flat Six Labs in Jeddah, there's uh, Badr. There are a lot of companies, there are a lot of startups that are coming. I think where the business model is a little bit broken is the advisory. I think in the US and Europe, uh, everybody has an advisory board. And it's not a board of directors, it's the advisory. And I think that's where you really, what, as an entrepreneur, your job is to go find these advisors, incentivize them to actually spend time with you, whether it's equity or money or whatever it is, and make sure that they give you a strong piece of advice. All right, thank you, Yusuf. I'm gonna again encourage all of you to come up to Yusuf and ask him so he can give you money. Not only Mohammed, so we have Yusuf over here. Yusuf, before we let you um, or release you from our first robot talk, an interesting thing. What does Beko stand for? I think I think we're all dying to know. I mean, I know because I, you know I looked you, you up. And we're, no, not Google, but I mean we're you know we've worked closely together before. But I think the audience would love to know, and I think that's where we share a little bit of a uh, shared sort of uh, ideology where the reward actual logo came from. So tell us. Booster engine cutoff. Does anybody know what that means? Yeah, I think there's a couple of engineers. Yeah, there's Ed over there who knows. <laughs> so want to tell us, Ed? It is a rocket ship term, and it's the basically the engine of the rocket ship that helps the the rocket ship propels into space. And the minute it's in space, it disengages and falls down to earth. So that's what we stand for. We help companies get off the ground, and then we we walk away when they're successful. And, and Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.